Thank you very much, Claudia, and uh, thanks also to the organising committee for inviting me. Um, just uh, some disclosures. Uh, I have funding from various government uh, organisations and agencies, charities, and also relevant to this meeting, I chair the Population Systems Medicine Board at the Medical Research Council of the UK, which deals with uh, nutritional matters. So what I'd like to do uh, this morning is give a little bit of context as to why uh, one might be interested in the exposome, tell you what the exposome is, and focus particularly on the metabolome, metabolomics, what I call the nutriome, that looking at uh, nutrients uh, in relation to outcomes, and a little bit about why we might be also interested in the genome as that gives us a, an anchor point to look for causal pathways. And then uh, finish off um, talking about some big cohorts that are being established and that provide a vehicle for carrying out this type of work. And then a few key takeaways at the end. <coughs> so what is the, the context? So we know that um, in terms of chronic disease, um, there, there have been very large fluctuations, so there was the, if you like, emergency of the epidemic of cardiovascular disease uh, in the 50s and 60s, um, um, which became um, very apparent in, in North America, but also in Europe. And since then, from the, um, the 1950s and 60s onwards, there's been a, a, a remarkable decline in cardiovascular disease in many countries, so uh, US is the orange one, something like um, a two-thirds decline in uh, instance of cardiovascular disease. But that has been shared in many other countries, but not always at the same time. So for example, uh, there was a continuing increase, this is Hungary, in, in countries of Eastern Europe, and only now has the decline started. So if you look across Europe, there is remarkable differences in the rates of heart disease from Eastern Europe uh, through to Southern Europe, which is um, characterized by the Mediterranean diet. And there's something like a six-fold difference in mortality, uh, in mortality and instance rates. Um, and these are genetically very similar populations. At the same time, we've seen this massive increase in rates of overweight and obesity. Um, so uh, something like a three to four, four-fold increase in rates of obesity across the world from 1980s through to the present day. So clearly this is going in the wrong direction. And more generally, if we look at across the world, um, we, we see this transition, this so-called epidemiologic transition from infectious disease uh, and high mortality in um, infancy and around childbirth uh, people surviving through to uh, young adulthood and then into older adulthood, and then they become uh, susceptible to chronic diseases. So there's this massive switch from the infectious disease to the chronic disease, uh, a so-called grand challenge in non-communicable disease. And here you see, obviously, smoking and overweight as one of the major issues that we have to address, not only in developed countries, but also in the developing world. And this slide summarizes the upstream and proximal risk factors for cardiovascular disease, because clearly we see these diseases happening within the context of society. Uh, things like uh, living conditions, the natural and physical environment, including air pollution and noise pollution, which is a current focus of research. Uh, temperatures um, with, with um, climate change and increasing temperatures across the world. Uh, affecting uh, instance of cardiovascular disease and, of course, the social environment because these diseases uh, cluster amongst poorer people. And then if we look at the more proximal behavioral factors, uh, the things that we know about, smoking, alcohol, physical inactivity, but also poor diet that you've been discussing earlier today and we'll be discussing through the meeting, adiposity, and then we get to the more proximal physiological pathways that we can measure, uh, blood pressure, lipids, uh, blood glucose and diabetes, and um, um, inflammation, um, leading to subclinical atherosclerosis, 
and ultimately to clinical disease. So we need, if we want to maintain uh, the improvements in cardiovascular disease and also prevent uh, a resurgence of an epidemic of cardiovascular disease, clearly it's still the number one um, major cause of death around the world. Then we need to address the upstream determinants, but also the, um, the proximal uh, determinants. And there was discussion before the break about biomarkers uh, to develop appropriate biomarkers so that we can monitor the progression uh, through uh, subclinical atherosclerosis before clinical disease is onset. And if we think at the genetic level, we know there is genetic susceptibility to these diseases, to chronic disease in general, to cancer, to cardiovascular disease, and through the onset of um, the, the, uh, of the genetic uh, genome-wide association study, we know there are hundreds of genetic markers of the diseases, each with a very small, mainly for, for, for the chronic diseases, a very small effect, but nonetheless a detectable effect. And if you look at the various diseases, they seem to cluster genetically, and there seems to be a, uh, a uh, uh, common um, genetic markers across cardiovascular and metabolic disease, and in some extent, cancer. But against that um, genetic susceptibility, we know that it is the environmental factors which are really important in determining uh, who gets disease, who does not get disease, and at both at the population level and at the individual level. And this was uh, summarized by um, a diabetic doctor, a famous diabetic doctor from the US, Elliot Proctor Jocelyn, um, way back. Genetics loads the gun, that's the genetic susceptibility, but environment pulls the trigger. So if you live in a place, for example, if you uh, live in the Amazon basin and you're a Yanomamo uh, Indian, your blood pressure does not rise with age. But um, if people move, so for example, the Kenya, Kenyan Luo moving from their villages, rural villages to Nairobi, in their rural villages, their blood pressure is protected, their blood pressure does not rise with age. But as soon as they move, very quickly their blood pressure goes up. So we know that they're, they may have genetic susceptibility, they may have genetic protection, but as soon as they hit an environment which is conducive to chronic disease, uh, then very quickly um, the environmental factors uh, working against the background of genetic susceptibility makes one susceptible to these diseases. So we need to address environmental factors underlying the high prevalence of um, risk factors and, and, and high morbidity mortality from these diseases at older ages. So we have a major challenge because actually the genetic data, though there's a lot of it, so it's a big data problem, are pretty simple. There are not one to fix digital readout. Uh, but the environment changes over time. Um, it's very difficult to measure. Uh, and as we take the measurements, it, uh, you have a dynamic range uh, and it's continuously distributed and it's occurring over the life course. So we have very imprecise and, and poor measures of these environmental factors, including dietary factors, which <coughs> are notoriously difficult to uh, determine and collect through um, standard measurement techniques. So we do need new methods and approaches to capture the effects of environmental exposures on uh, non-communicable disease. So the concept is that we have these lifestyle and lifelong exposures related to where we live, the sort of culture we live in, but also our individual preferences. And that has effect at the molecular level, that will then perturb metabolic pathways, which we can maybe capture at the systems level, and maybe identify biomarkers of exposure, and also early biomarkers of um, effect disease biomarkers. And that determines our molecular phenotype, which as I say is on the trajectory from health to disease, and ultimately that will determine the clinical phenotype, whether we progress to actual disease, clinical disease. And uh, we need to work across all these systems to understand uh, this relationship and potentially and hopefully then we can intervene 
uh, in terms of um, policies, improved policies to protect health and ultimately improved health at the individual level, because this could be personalized, and at the group population level. So moving on, uh, I'm going to focus on the metabolome. And what is the metabolome? So metabolomics is the capture and measurement of small molecules in biological samples, most commonly in blood, also in urine, but it can be in other samples. And the metabolites represent the downstream end products, biochemical end products of, um, of metabolism uh, across all systems, if you're capturing it in, in, in something like blood or urine. Um, but it's the closest to the phenotype in terms of these omics. So you start here with the genome, uh, the epigenome, which talks about how we transcribe the genetic information, the transcriptome, which captures that transcription, uh, the proteome, the proteins driven from the genome, and then downstream metabolism is captured through the metabolome, which will be affected by things such as your age, your sex, your ethnicity, your diet, physical activity, stress, um, in utero effects because this is over the whole life course, um, external uh, xenobiotics such as pollution and drugs, where you live, and also the gut microflora, the microbiota. And um, what it does, it gives the link between these environmental stressors, your intrinsic metabolism, your genetic information, and that uh, um, uh, transfer between the healthy state and the disease state. And conceptually, you can think of it as you have ideal health through your life course, might be represented by this line. No one ever achieves ideal health. So um, healthy people might be working along this trajectory over the life course, um, um, but unhealthy people might be going on a much worse trajectory. And what we want to be able to do is to capture these people early on in their life course and understand who is going down this route versus that route, potentially intervene, and hopefully then recover uh, a healthy um, uh, profile, which will lead to um, um, prolongation of healthy living and reduction in um, early disease, cardiovascular cancer, or whatever. So how do we carry out the metabolic profiling or the metabolomics? So the, the two main techniques are through nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy and mass spectrometry. Um, they capture different things. They have different sensitivities. But the idea is that you have a stressor or in an experimental situation, you might be looking at a knockout uh, animal model. Uh, you might be diseased, which will affect the metabolome, or there might be other sources of toxicity. That has an effect at the cellular level and the tissue level, and ultimately that will spill out into the biofluid affected by external stressors such as diet, the gut microbiome, uh, other chemicals, and then we capture the metabolic profile, as I say, at one point in time, or Preferably, we capture it at multiple points in time during the life course. Um, and um, we then um, get a spectral readout from NMR, which is um, one-dimensional, and from mass spec, which is two-dimensional. But the challenge is we capture, if you're doing so-called untargeted metabolomics, where you're capturing the whole spectrum, you're getting huge amounts of information. It's very information rich, but it's complex. And uh, the challenge is to retrieve useful data from, from these signals. So uh, for NMR, you might capture thousands of signals representing hundreds of metabolites. And for mass spectrometry, maybe in the tens of thousands of signals and maybe the thousands of metabolites um, at various levels of uh, sensitivity. So I mentioned um, you can do this metabolomics either in targeted form where you test for specific metabolites and pathways, which is clearly uh, attractive but misses a lot of the information that is out there that you potentially can capture. 
or you go through untargeted mode um, where you capture everything, but then you have the problem of finding signals and trying to interpret those signals. So we have the analytics, which is for, via NMR or mass spectrometry. Um, we will discover new biomarkers against an outcome of interest, for example, cardiovascular disease. Um, and then we need to identify those biomarkers. And this can be quite a complex process because you've got to do structural elucidation of those signals. Um, you have to characterize those biomarkers. As with any biomarker discovery program, you need to validate those biomarkers in independent cohorts uh, and then um, potentially um, test those biomarkers as um, potential predictive markers of future disease. So the steps in the analysis are um, to use um, these technologies and um, uh, in my declarations, I'm a co-investigator of what's called the MRC uh, NIHR National Phenome Center in the UK, uh, where we are using, working with industry um, in terms of the instrument manufacturers, Waters uh, for mass spectrometry and Bruker for NMR, and using state-of-the-art methods to capture the information from biological fluids, as I say, mainly blood and urine to get so-called fingerprinting of those fluids. And then you combine those data with um, extensive uh, personal characterized data, mainly from cohorts, large cohorts, on clinical information, lifestyle information, but also other omic data sets. So this is a big data fusion problem. And then carry out bioinformatic and pathway analyses to place those metabolites into uh, potential causative pathways uh, and clearly this is a complex uh, program. Uh, the, uh, the, the methods um, are in some ways bespoke, and so it's extremely important that these methods are standardized uh, across um, both the NMR and the mass spectrometry and across different laboratories who are doing this sort of work. So we're setting up what's called an international phenome center network to develop these common methods and to develop these common standards so that we can get an international network that can do this sort of work. And here's an example from uh, the Intermap study, which is a study of diet and blood pressure in four countries, the UK, the US from the West, China and Japan in the East, 17 population samples involving over 4,500 men and women in the age range 40 to 59. And we collected uh, multiple blood pressure measurements. We collected multiple um, dietary, 24-hour dietary recalls by face-to-face -face interview. And we also collected 24-hour urine collections, some on two occasions, three to six weeks apart. And I'm going to focus on the urine collections because those we've analyzed using NMR spectroscopy for the metabolome. But just to mention in passing uh, the results for the four countries from the 24-hour recalls. So this is China, Japan, uh, the UK, and the US. The purple bars are the percent calories from sugar. This is the US, this is China. Clearly a uh, very different uh, diet, as you know. Um, uh, this is the starch intake percent calories in China, and this is in the US. And down here we have the vegetable intake much higher in China than in the US. So very, very different diets, as you're all very well aware. And this is, the, uh, this is taking the um, total urinary metabolome for each of these uh, 17 population centers and doing a hierarchical clustering analysis to see how they fall. And you can see that the eastern samples were differentiated from the Western samples. Sadly for the UK, we ended up looking just like an American uh, center. So we became the, so uh, from sort of our metabolome, we are the 51st state, here's the UK. And uh, you can see that, uh, so in the US, um, there's some clustering, these are, these are females, these are males, there's some clustering by uh, gender. 
Um, and here in Japan, um, it's the, again, you've got some clustering by gender, and in China, uh, the clustering is only by place. Now, interestingly, the, the Chinese and the Japanese, who are genetically quite similar, are distinct in terms of the metabolome, and the Japanese, Chinese, distinct from the West. But this group here, the Honolulu sample from the US, are Japanese Americans, and they map like Americans. So, they, so the metabolome is reflecting their lifestyle, mainly not their genetics. Though, interestingly, they're the closest mapping of the Americans to the Japanese. So there's some genetic signal that's appearing in the, in the urinary metabolome, but it's mainly a lifestyle signal reflecting that the fact that they're living in a US environment. And in China, the north and the south of China were distinct despite being genetically very similar. And if we look at that further on this plot, PCA plot, uh, you can see that the north of China is very much distinguished from the south of China. And the north of China, they have higher risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke. They have higher blood pressure. They have much higher urinary sodium excretion, much higher uh, sodium-potassium ratio, lower calcium, lower magnesium excretion, and, uh, and as I say, higher risk of, of stroke and cardiovascular disease. And metabolically, they're very different, but genetically, they're very similar. So within that study, we then looked at the signals which were differentiating the different populations and then related those signals to blood pressure. And for example, we found this association between urinary formate excretion and uh, blood pressure. And this had not been identified previously. So this is, if you like, discovery. And using what we call the metabolome-wide association approach, using agnostic approach to look at all the possible signals in relation to the outcome, in this case, blood pressure, and, um, and then adjusting for the fact that we'd done this multiple testing, and came up with a, a hypothesis that formate was involved in, uh, in, in blood pressure regulation, and it so happens that formate is involved in the chloride exchange in the kidney, so there's a potential mechanism. And uh, looking now at um, measures of uh, adiposity and obesity, so this is looking at body mass index as a, as a marker of adiposity in the same population. This is in the US Intermap sample. Um, and um, again, looking at the urinary metabolome, not looking at obese versus non-obese, but looking across the entire range of body mass index from low to high. And uh, with, with BMI as, as, a, as a marker, you get this very, very intense signals. Um, um, so the, the red signals here, this is the NMR spectrum. The red signals are higher with higher BMI, and the blue signals are lower with, uh, with BMI. Right across the, the spectrum, you find these, these signals. And if we put those into uh, some sort of pathway analysis here, you can see, so the, the signals that we detected are either red for higher or blue for lower, and um, every system is disturbed uh, as your BMI goes up. So this is involving uh, muscle metabolism, mitochondrial metabolism, um, lipid metabolism, uh, the Krebs cycle, etc. And interestingly, there's also gut microbial co-signatures which are also involved in this. So, so this is a, a stress, this is not just looking at obesity, this is right across the, the range of adiposity. There are multiple systems involved. Most of these are probably secondary rather than primary, so they're not causal. They're secondary to increasing BMI, has, has um, system-wide um, um, metabolic and molecular disturbances associated with it. And I mentioned at the beginning um, that we also, on many of these cohorts and individuals, have genetic data, mainly from um, so-called GWAS, genome-wide association um, chips. And um, we've been very interested in using those genetic data to try and inform causal pathways in relation to um, how those genetic signals, which we know are related, for example, to coronary heart disease, which is this group over here, or this signal here is related to Alzheimer's disease, 
can we get information from the metabolome that will help define these pathways? Because many of these genetic signals, we know nothing about how they are involved and how they increase or cause disease. We know they are causal because um, unlike everything else that we measure, the gene is fixed. So the gene is fixed and they relate um, uh, reliably and uh, in a, in a, in a cross-validated way to outcome, then we know that we're on a causal pathway. But we don't know what the intermediate effects are. And if we can outline those pathways, maybe we can intervene either with new therapies or with preventive approaches and lifestyle approaches. So this is looking at um, uh, a targeted uh, uh, analysis based on so-called Helmholtz metabolomics database um, at various uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms that have been detected in relation to coronary artery disease and various um, uh, m metabolites have been identified, are, are associated with these SNPs, and there are some unidentified metabolites which, um, which ne would need to be identified to try and work out those pathways. And here's another example from our so-called airwave study, which is a study of 50,000 police officers and staff in the UK, looking at a SNP in a gene, ABCA7, which is associated with Alzheimer's disease, about, but about which we know nothing about function. And you can see, using uh, one of the mass, spec, mass spectrometry analysis that we did, that we get very, very strong associations with some of these metabolites, all of which currently are unknown, but we're currently working out what these are. So this might give some new insight into the pathways linking this gene to the outcome. And uh, just very briefly want to touch on the nutriome. And what do I mean by the nutriome? Well, again, this is the intermap data. And what we've done is take, taken all the, um, the uh, individual nutrients detected on the 24-hour um, uh, dietary recalls and related these to blood pressure in an agnostic way. So just taken a whole bunch of the nutrients and related them to blood pressure and then adjusted appropriately for the multiple testing. And many of the things we find, we already knew about, for example, urinary sodium is positively associated with blood pressure, or in this case, the sodium-potassium ratio. And at this end, we have things like alcohol and iron intake and vegetable protein intake, which we'd already reported. But over here, we had a whole bunch of uh, new signals that we hadn't, hadn't thought about, hadn't detected previously, related to B vitamin and, uh, and blood pressure. So again, using this agnostic discovery approach, you can find out new things. And we then went on to validate and replicate these findings in the NHANES uh, database. And you can do other things with such data. So here is, here's all the nutrients. And we've related that to the metabolome. And um, red means that they are positively associated and significantly with what comes out in the urine. And blue means that they're, they're inversely associated. So already we can then start looking at pathways between dietary intake along the bottom and the uh, uh, metabolites that we detect uh, either in urine or blood. And uh, so the, over here, these are the amino acids. So what comes in comes out. But there are big white areas where what comes in doesn't come out in that form. And blue areas where uh, what, come, what goes in has some um, metabolic transformation or use and comes out in a different form or is associated in a different way with the metabolites. So this is potentially giving huge amount of information about dietary intake and, and metabolic consequences of dietary intake in an, in an agnostic way. And uh, so this slide summarizes a couple of um, studies trying to detect new biomarkers of dietary intake because, as I mentioned earlier, and as you all know, the physical measures of attaining information at the individual level of dietary intake are quite unreliable depending on um, uh, interview or recall or filling out questionnaires. Uh, and they, they, they're prone to bias and they're, they're prone to uh, inaccuracy. So it would be fantastic if we could develop new biomarkers of intake 
uh, that could then be used to monitor people, as was, was discussed by Dr. Williams before the, for, before the break. So here's one example where there was a trial, so this is all done in trial, randomized trial mode, uh, where um, uh, there was a standard diet and then the standard diet plus fruit was tested and uh, a signal appeared in the, in the urine, a metabolomic signature appeared, which turned out to be proline betaine. And that was then tested uh, and indeed, um, proline betaine is contained in citrus fruit and proline betaine turns out to be a very good marker of citrus fruit intake, of health, healthful diet. And here's another example uh, published in the Lancet Diabetes Endocrinology uh, last year, um, looking at, uh, in a randomized trial, four diets. Uh, diet one was like the DASH type diet, a healthy diet, and, and diet four was an unhealthy, usual American type diet. And uh, again, looking at the urinary metabolome using uh, nu nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and there were some metabolites which were higher in the healthy diet, some higher in the unhealthy diet. Um, and then if you look at some of these, for example, hipparate, which is a marker of uh, fruit intake, and it's a gut microbial uh, co-metabolite, is higher in the healthy diet. And uh, carnitine, on the other hand, which is a marker of meat intake, higher in the unhealthy diet. And over here you've got uh, tartrate, which is a biomarker for grape intake. Again, that was higher in the healthy diet. So potentially at the sort of whole diet level, you can develop a metabolomic signature. This was then tested in um, uh, two population cohorts and found to reflect um, DASH score in those cohorts. So potentially you could, you know, could think of this as developing a ongoing biomarker of diet adherence to something like a, a DASH type diet or a healthy diet uh, to follow people up over time, what happens to their urinary metabolome. Okay, so I just want to finish talking about cohorts because this offers the substrate with which to test many of these um, possibilities in terms of these omic technologies and to look at the exposome in relation to long-term health outcomes. So there are many initiatives around the world now um, looking at uh, setting up and establishing very large cohorts to do this type of work. So in, in, in the US, you've got the Million Vets program and you've got the Precision Medicine program, both looking at a million people. In the UK, we have so-called UK Biobank, which I'll come back to. Airwave study I mentioned to you. Uh, there's the EPIC study, another half million study, um, which is uh, across Europe. Um, Kadori study in China, another half million study, Biobank Japan, 200,000, and the Korean Biobank, half a million. So these are very, very large programs looking at following people up over time with biological samples so that you can go back and look at the genome and the metabolome and the transcriptome and the proteome uh, as potential biomarkers for future events as they accrue into the cohorts. So I'm just going to focus a little bit on, on UK Biobank. So um, Biobank collected um, clinical data at a, a clinical assessment center for half a million people who were approached via the National Health Service. Uh, uh, a lot of lifestyle information was collected, co cognitive testing was collected, um, accelerometry was collected on, on 100,000. So it was really deep phenotyping um, and of course um, biological samples were taken, um, blood and urine uh, aliquoted and stored in, and actually stored in a very large um, robot, which you can see here. And uh, 100,000 of those half million people are being invited back now to have uh, MRI scans, DEXA scans for bone density uh, and also muscle, uh, carotid scans for um, early signs of atherosclerosis and, and deep uh, phenotyping of the retina, as you can see here. So very, very deep phenotyping with um, biological samples to follow those people up. How are they being followed up? It's being done th mainly through record linkage. So as I say, we have the advantage of the National Health Service in the UK so that we can go to cancer registries, we can go to pathology records, uh, records of drugs, uh, go to GP records, 
um, but also link in to the cohort uh, information about the, 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 the xenobiotics that I mentioned, like uh, environmental data, information about the built environment. So very, very rich information that will allow us to explore um, uh, long-term effects of uh, the environment, environmental lifestyle exposures on health. We're currently looking, so at the moment, all half million people have had a genome-wide scan using um, Affymetric uh, chip that we're now looking at doing full sequencing on, on those people and uh, also discussing now the metabolome as the next sort of um, study-wide test that we might try and do on UK Biobank. Now, as I said, the, as you can see, this is a big data problem. And to bring all this together needs um, a multidisciplinary approach. Um, we need uh, new methodologies. Uh, we're bringing together um, uh, the computer people, with the data people, with the health people. And the idea is that the, the whole is greater than the parts. But this is a massive effort and requires a whole new way of thinking and working if we're going to make advances, uh, much as was discussed before the break. So my last slide, uh, we do have these new technologies and methodologies using this omic uh, data, uh, which opens up fantastic opportunities for discovery of new biomarkers in relation to disease outcomes uh, and intermediate outcomes for the non-communicable diseases. Uh, we need to apply these to these cohorts where we have uh, embedded long-term follow-up so we can look at the results from uh, exposures many years ago and future health outcomes. And by taking advantage of all those cohorts around the world, we have the opportunity to validate and replicate, and that's extremely important, as we've learned from the GWAS studies. This will give us new insights on pathways and mechanisms linking environmental exposures to disease, the so-called exposome, uh, and hopefully by getting that new information, we will be able to intervene better and earlier to prevent disease. Uh, but to, as I said in the previous slide, to take advantage of all this data, we need to have completely new ways of working uh, across disciplines. Um, uh, so we need the physical sciences to work with the life sciences and the medical sciences to really make um, advances in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Very, very interesting. We're going to take one or two questions. Um, we're running a little short on time. If you could just introduce yourself. Yeah. My name is Gary Beecham. I'm from the Monell Center. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed your talk. I, I have a specific question, though, for you. I, I've had a long interest in salt, and obviously you have, too. Um, is there uh, any biomarker for salt intake? Uh, just on a practical level, people really don't know how much salt they're consuming. And doing 24-hour urines is, for the average person, just not practical. And it's maybe not even true. Um, is there some progress in this area where you could have something that would be a, a marker that an individual or, or, or could use that would really reflect the sodium intake over time? Well, as you say, I've been working on this for a long time. Um, so we do believe that, you know, 24-hour urine is a good biomarker. Um, but as you say, it's difficult to collect in population studies. And really, you need, as you know, multiple collections. And that's, that is difficult to achieve. Um, we are looking at the spot urine in UK Biobank. We have half a million people. Uh, and as you probably also know, we've been looking at spot urine in relation to 24-hour urine because it is a much more tractable marker. Probably at the population level, it probably works. At the uh, individual level, it's tricky. So funnily enough, we, are, we do have an NIH grant to look at this question, to look at the urinary metabolome in relation to sodium intake. So I'm hoping that we will come up with a better biomarker. You know, John Erdman, University of Illinois. Actually, my question relates directly to uh, population level versus individual level on uh, um, metabolome. I mean, there's great value for the metabolome. 
But at, at the individual level, um, if I come and have my urine uh, done and it was a stressful day or um, you know, I have a mild I inflammation of some sort, I I'm going to have a totally different readout. And uh, just wondering if you could comment on the value at the individual level. Yeah. So you're, you're right. I mean, um, you know, it only doesn't vary day to day. It probably varies, you know, minute to minute or hour to hour. But actually, we looked at this within the Intermap data because we had repeated 24-hour urines. And to our surprise, it was remarkably stable. So the signals that we got looking at the first of the, those urines uh, was very, very similar to the signal we got in the second of those urines. And actually, when we compared the two urine samples at the individual level, they clustered in, you know, in metabolic space you know, similarly. So actually, I think um, there are minute-to-minute, day-to-day perturbations, but the underlying signal related to who you are and what you eat and what you do is, I think, quite constant. So that's very helpful for this sort of work. Um, just on COVID ILC North America, um, has new approaches in omics um, give us better indication of identifying salt sensitive individuals? Um, okay, so we haven't looked at that yet. Um, my view on salt sensitivity is that you've got a whole range of responses to sodium right across the range. And uh, it's artificial, in my view, to separate people into salt sensitive individuals and non salt sensitive individuals. I think we all have a degree of salt sensitivity, if you like insofar as if you do randomized trials of reducing sodium intake, on average, blood pressure will be reduced across the board. And, um, and, and it's, I don't think it's that helpful to talk about salt sensitivity. It's a bit like looking at hypertension and non-hypertension. We know that the blood pressure outcome relationship goes right across the whole range of blood pressure from low to high. Um, and it's the same, for example, looking at those uh, adiposity biomarkers. It, it wasn't just if you're obese, you have this very different metabolome. It's right across the range of BMI. So I, my view is that, um, yes, some people will have a, a bigger fall in blood pressure can, you know, if they go on a lower sodium diet than others, but um, everyone ultimately will benefit. So my view is it's not particularly helpful. Take one more question here. Al Place at IMET. What about multiple associated biomarkers? In other words, not just one changing or correlated, but in fact, there are multiple correlations among themselves. Yeah. So that's the beauty of the uh, taking that metabolomic untargeted approach. You get the whole spectrum. And, um, and obviously, they're all highly correlated. So you've got you know, a very correlated set of data, uh, which is, you know, w what we try to get at with that network is that they're, they're not working one at, one at a time, as you, obviously, as you say, but you're looking at a whole network perturbation. Um, and, um, but you can capture all that if you look at the entire spectrum. But, you know, it's not easy. Working out what's really going on is not easy. It's all multidimensional. It's not unidimensional. But it's, a, you know, that's one of the big data challenges, I think, from this type of work. But uh, you capture all the, all the data, you capture all the information, therefore you can potentially make the right inferences. All right, thanks again, Paul. Thanks very much. <laughs>